Aloha friends, mahalo for joining us for today's Wildlife Wednesday lecture. My name is Catherine and I am the branch manager of the Princeville Public Library on Kauai, one of the 51 libraries in the Hawaii State Public Library system. Wildlife Wednesdays is in celebration of Wildlife Refuge Week. This series is a partnership between the Kauai National Wildlife Refuge Complex, Conservation Dogs of Hawaii, USGS, the US Geological Survey, Pacific Rim Conservation, the Hawaii State Public Library System, and the Friends of Kauai Wildlife Refuges. This lecture is followed by a Q&A. Throughout the lecture, please submit your questions through the Q&A feature. At the close, all of your questions will be answered. Today, I am happy to introduce my longtime programming partner, Krista McLeod. Krista is here to introduce today's guest lecturer. Krista, the virtual floor is yours. Mahalo, Kat. Um, I am the Environmental Education and Outreach Park Ranger for Kauai National Wildlife Refuge Complex. And before I introduce today's presenter, I would like to share why the National Wildlife Refuge System is so important. It is a network of lands and waters that conserves and protects America's precious wildlife heritage. The refuge system protects some of the country's most iconic ecosystems, while offering outstanding recreation to nearly 60 million people at its 567 wildlife refuges and 38 wetland management units from Maine, my home state, all the way to the Marianas. Founded by President Theodore Roosevelt in 1903, refuges offer access to a host of popular activities while providing vital habitat for thousands of wildlife species. As for Hawaii, the first refuge was established in 1909, and today there are 22 refuge units throughout the Pacific Islands, as well as shared management of Papahānaumokuākea Marine National Monument. Today I'm happy to introduce Christina Montoya Eona of USGS. We were very happy to host her and her colleague here on Kauai in 2019, where our staff joined them for nine nights of mist netting at Hanalei and Puleia National Wildlife Refuge, where they were the first to ever capture a live bat on the island of Kauai. This excitement of milestone was very real, even though it happened at 3 a.m. Um, we are very grateful for their research and the data that they provided uh, to us about how to better manage for this elusive animal in our twilight landscape. Christina, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Krista and Kat, for having me. And welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining me this afternoon. Um, very excited to talk about my favorite subject, which is bats, and more specifically, our Hawaiian hoary bat, Opeapea. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, okay, yeah, this talk is going to be broken into a few sections. Uh, first, I'm going to just discuss some like general bat facts. Then I'll move into background about our Hawaiian hoary bat, Opeapea. And finally, I'm gonna finish with some exciting research we've been working on. So bats are from the scientific order Chiroptera, which translates to hand wing. They are the only mammals capable of true and sustained flight. They are mammals, which means they're endothermic or so-called warm-blooded, um, and they must generate their own heat to maintain optimal body temperature. They have fur, which helps serve this purpose, and they give birth to live pups and produce milk. There are currently over 1,400 known bat species worldwide. They are the second largest order of mammals and account for one-fifth of all mammal species. They are widespread all over the world and found on every continent except for Antarctica. So with over 1,400 species worldwide, that means there is an incredible amount of diversity among these bat species. And there are bats that eat fruit, those that eat nectar and pollen, those that eat small vertebrates like amphibians, fish, birds, and rodents. 
and probably one of the most infamous are those that eat blood or vampire bats. However, out of the more than 1,400 species, there are only three species that are vampire bats, and those are found in Mexico, Central, and South America. And finally, like our very own Opeapea, there are species that eat insects. Bats are also diverse in their roosting and social behaviors. Some roost in large colonies, while others, like our Opeapea, are solitary. They also roost in a variety of places, including plants and trees, caves and crevices, and man-made structure, structures like buildings and bridges. So with all these species and all this diversity, we have to have a way of organizing them. And how do we do that? So bat species have traditionally been organized um, and divided into two groups. Um, that's based on their morphology and behavior, and that is microchiroptera and megachiroptera. There have been proposed revisions uh, to this division, but for our purposes today and for simplicity's sake, we'll stick with this. In general, micro bats are smaller bats and use echolocation to find food, while megabats are larger and all except one species do not use echolocation. Instead, megabats are reliant on their eyesight and sense of smell for foraging. Bats also range in size from tiny bumblebee bats weighing less than a penny to giant flying foxes with nearly six foot wingspans. And bats are important and provide a variety of ecosystem services. Insectivorous bats are crucial for pest control. Several bat species consume mosquitoes that carry the deadly West Nile virus and save U.S. farmers alone an estimated $23 billion annually in pest control. For example, Mexican free-tail bats in central Texas help, an especially, help target an especially damaging pest called the corn earworm moth. And this attacks a host of commercial plants from artichokes to watermelons. Similarly, in northeastern Spain, the soprano pipistrelle bat helps control the rice borer moth, which is a major pest of rice around the world. And our very own Opeapea has been found to have termites, mosquitoes, as well as agricultural pests like the southern green stink bug in its guano. There are over 500 plant species either dispersed or pollinated by bats, including bananas, almonds, and agave. We wouldn't have tequila without bats since agave is almost exclusively pollinated by the greater long-nosed bat. And finally, guano mined from caves is an excellent source of nitrogen and phosphorus and is highly prized as fertilizer. In many cultures, bats are revered and sometimes appear in creation stories. Zots was the Mayan word for bat, and the Mayan vampire bat god was named Kamazots. The glyph for the great pre-Columbian city of Copan in Honduras was the head of a leaf-nosed bat. Until the 20th century in Japanese culture, the bat was popularly viewed as a good luck symbol, and its image is often used in pottery, sword hilts, and kimonos. Malaysians depict bats in positive ways both in art and creation stories. And throughout many Asian cultures, bats continue to evoke strong, positive emotions. Our Opeapea is culturally significant to Hawaii. In the Kumulipo, which is the Hawaiian creation chant, bats are created before humans and are considered kupuna or ancestor. While bats are celebrated in some cultures, in others, there are still negative associations that persist. Popular misconceptions that still persist are that bats are flying rodents and that they're blind. And we know, in fact, that bats are not flying rodents and they're not blind at all. Most ha bats have very good eyesight and are incredibly agile, even those that use sonar or echolocation calls to navigate. So they're not going to get tangled in your hair. You can ask any bat biologist who attempts to capture them, and we will tell you how difficult that is to, to capture. And that's because of their incredible spatial awareness. 
Um, another misconception is that all bats carry rabies. Um, in fact, all mammals can contract and carry rabies. Worldwide, bats contract rabies far less than other animal, animals, and 99% of deaths from rabies come from contact with rabid dogs. In the United States, however, due to successful rabies vaccination programs, contracting rabies is very rare. And we are especially fortunate here in Hawaii because of very strict quarantine laws, Hawaii is rabies free, which also means that our bats don't have rabies. Uh, worldwide, bats are natural reservoirs for more than 60 viruses. And although it is rare, these viruses can infect humans such as Ebola, rabies, and histoplasmosis. Unlike humans, bats can harbor these diseases without becoming sick because they have a naturally high immunity to these viruses. And it is for this very reason that researchers believe that bats may hold the key to understanding and combating viral infections in humans. The important thing to understand is that bats aren't just flying around willy-nilly spreading diseases to humans. It's the ways in which humans are treating bats that is allowing these diseases to spread. For example, humans are hunting and eating bats, a common practice in Africa and Asia, encroaching on bat habitat to raise livestock and build homes, and even, and even harvesting bats for the cruel exotic pet trade and other purposes. However, when we give bats the respect and space they deserve, we can live harmoniously with these incredible species. And unfortunately, worldwide, bats are facing many threats. In North America, white nose syndrome is a disease of hibernating bats caused by the recently discovered fungus called Pseudogymnoascus destructans. White nose syndrome primarily affects bats during the winter. The growth of the fungus is on the skin and it disturbs hibernation, resulting in dehydration, starvation, and often death. Since its detection in the US in 2006, white nose syndrome has unfortunately killed more than 6 million bats in 35 states and seven Canadian provinces. This disease could possibly lead to the extinction of some bat species and the loss of their valuable contributions to nature. In many parts of the world, bats are victims of casual killing or culling, the result of these harmful myths and misplaced fears. They are also hunted for local consumption and commercially for markets, restaurants, and use in tra traditional folk medicines. Forest habitat, which many bats use for roosting and foraging, are disappearing at alarming rates. The danger is even more significant for tropical forests in Central and South America, which is home to the richest diversity of bat species. Caves and abandoned mines also serve as roosts for many species, and countless numbers of bats are driven out uh, due to inappropriate guano mining and thoughtless tourism. Climate change is also posing a major threat to global bat populations. And this includes mortality from increased severity and frequency of extreme weather events. For example, flying foxes are dying at alarming numbers in Australia due to extreme heat waves. Bats on islands are uh, threatened by severe tropical storms, especially when coupled with extensive habitat loss. Increased aridity and drought reduce survival of reproductive success of bats, and bats in arid and semi-arid landscapes have lower fitness during drought. The long-term consequences of this could result in range contraction of bat species and, lots of, and loss of bat diversity. And also changes in timing of migration for potential phenology mismatch between bats and food resources. Species of insectivorous or pollinating bats um, that undergo these long distance migrations and develop seasonal timing of food resources to fuel the migrations could be negatively impacted by shifts in phenology of available resources, for example, flowering plants or seasonal insect abundance. And so for all these reasons, bats, including our Opeopea, need our help and understanding now more than ever. So our Hawaiian hoary bat, or Opeapea, is the only extant native terrestrial mammal in Hawaii. It has historically been recognized as a subspecies of the North American hoary bat, 
And through recent genetic research, um, it has been elevated to full species status. They are a solitary species, meaning they don't roost in large colonies. They are also insectivorous, feeding mainly on moths, beetles, stink bugs, and termites. So they are tree roosting, uh, more specifically foliage roosting, whereas some um, bat species roost in cavities of trees or under bark. Our opeopea roosts among the foliage of the trees. Females typically give birth to twin pups during the reproductive season, which consists of pregnancy, generally from April to June, lactation from June to August, post-lactation and fledging from August to November, with pups usually fully fledged and independent of their mother by November. And while the timings of these seasons um, can overlap and are likely variable year to year, as well as among individuals, these uh, patterns have been generally demonstrated by our own capture records, as well as previous research. And the name Opiapia is in reference to its wing shape, resembling a canoe sail or half tarot leaf as demonstrated here. There's been um, phenotypic divergence from its ancestor, the mainland hoary bat, by the Hawaiian hoary bat, which has resulted in about a 45% reduction in body mass size and about 8% reduction in forearm length. Um, our adult Hawaiian hoary bats are small. They range in size from about 12 to 24 grams. Um, they also exhibit reverse body size sexual dimorphism, which means females are slightly larger than males. Their bodies are covered in thick fur, including the uropotasium or interfemoral membrane, which is the tail membrane. Their fur is typically a mixture of reddish browns and grays, sometimes tinged to various extents with silvery white fur, which produces this frosted or hoary effect. And these photos here are examples of the color morphologies that we see in Opeakea. And just a note that these two bats were captured on the same night in the same location. The Opeopea has been listed as endangered under both Federal Endangered Species Act and Hawaii Endangered Species Laws since 1970. And it was designated as the official state land mammal of Hawaii in 2015. The main reasons for these listings is lack of information as well as threats to the species, including unknowns like population size and survivorship, and also threats including collisions with vehicles, wind turbines, barbed wire fences, um, pesticides, we don't quite know how that affects bats, and predation and loss and changes to critical habitat. And this photo is actually a picture of a bat being rehabbed by the good people at Hawaii Wildlife Center on Hawaii Island. Um, and this was after a suspected car strike. And Opiopia have a statewide distribution, and this has been based mainly on acoustic records and monitoring. There have been several acoustic studies on Kauai over the last years, um, over the years. Bellwood and Fullard, uh, who looked at echolocation and foraging behavior at the Koke'e Air National Guard radar site. Fullard again did an acoustic survey uh, for the seasonal distribution of Hawaiian hoary bats. And in 2017, the US Fish and Wildlife Service did acoustic surveys to document presence and activity at all national wildlife refuges on Kauai. In addition to acoustic monitoring that has been conducted on Kauai, there's also been acoustic surveys on Hawaii Island, Maui, Molokai, and uh, Ko'olawe and Oahu. Acoustic monitoring um, consists of bat detector stations that have these sensitive ultrasonic microphones that detect and record echolocation calls. Um, acoustic surveys give us presence and absence information as well as some behavior because we can distinguish social calls from foraging and search phase calls. And these are examples of sonograms showing a few types of bat echolocation calls that we see. And we're gonna listen to some examples of bat echolocation calls that have been slowed down and converted so that we can hear them since typical um, 
echolocation calls are at frequencies above the normal human hearing. So first we'll listen to a search phase call used by bats. And this is typically when they're moving about an area and searching for insect prey. And I want you to notice how slow and methodical the pulses of echolocation are that are sent out uh, as this bat is moving through an area. Next, we'll listen to feeding buzzes, and these are used by bats as they're honing in on insect prey. And so bats will send out a rapid series of echolocation pulses to pinpoint prey before they strike. And finally, we're going to listen to some social calls. Social calls um, are seen when there's more than one bat in an area. Typically, the bats will avoid using the exact same frequency band. And we can't count the number of bats in a particular call file, but we can determine when there is at least more than one. While acoustic monitoring has its advantages um, and can give us a ton of information, it can't give us all of the demographic information that we want. And acoustic surveys are valuable. They give us a passive monitoring technique. They're relatively inexpensive compared to other data collection methods, but they can't give us abundance or population numbers, sex of the bats, or prey that the bat is targeting. And for these reasons, we turn to genetic approaches to help us get information about these important pieces of bat ecology. And one way that we've harnessed the power of genetics techniques was to determine the sex of bats killed at wind turbines, which is super important for mitigation measures. The problem was that unless the carcass was quite fresh, less than two days old, the sex of the decayed or partially scavenged carcasses were really difficult or nearly impossible to identify from external observation. And because of our tropical climate, there was rapid degradation of the soft tissue, decomposition, and scavenging by both insects and other animals. And this led to a male biased data set in which females were often identified as unknown. And so we tested the utility of a protocol using genetic markers previously proved successful to identify the sex of other Vespertilionid bats on tissue collected from live bats and carcasses of varying age. This molecular method is based on genes unique to X and Y chromosomes in mammals and previously was successful on North American hoary bats. In our study, we found that genotyping determined the sex of 36 individuals of Hawaiian hoary bat carcasses, previously, previously assigned sex only by ex examining the external genitalia, and also identified the sex for 29 previously unknown bat carcasses that could not be classified by external genitalia. And this successful study gave a more accurate representation of bat fatalities at wind turbines in Hawaii. Another way that we've used genetic techniques is for DNA metabarcoding to determine bat diet. Habitat protection and restoration are currently the mitigation measures available to offset bat fatalities at wind farm facilities. Overall goals of restoration are to create habitat types that offer roosting and foraging opportunities for bats. And previous diet studies have focused on dissecting bat guano pellets and identifying contents through microscopy. However, soft-bodied insects, such as moths, are quickly digested, and so they may be underrepresented through this method compared to beetles and other insects with tough exoskeletons. 
So DNA meta barcoding of the guano pellets helps give more helps give us a more complete picture of insects in a bat's diet. So we had the opportunity to investigate the diet of bats on Maui and around the Pu'u Makua bat mitigation area, as well as the surrounding Waiho vicinity on Ulupalakua Ranch in southern Maui. At this particular site, the goal is to restore native forests from retired grass pasture and determine if it was harboring suitable bat insect prey. We captured bats and collected bat guano to determine contents genetically. And we also collected available insects to create our reference library. So we compared the insect reference library of what is available in the habitat to what bats consume and was found in their diet. And we found an overlap between our library and the prey available for bats at the restoration site and the bat guano contents. And we are continuing to apply this technique on guano samples collected on Hawaii Island, which will help us get a better understanding of bat diet as well as insect prey and host plant associations, which can help provide guidance on bat habitat restoration. And finally, a key component that we're currently working on in the realm of bat genetics is getting at population structure and gene flow across the Hawaiian archipelago. This also includes examining the genetic diversity as well as historical and contemporary effective population sizes. This is important because genetic variability and population structure may affect resilience to sustained mortality from threats, such as wind turbines, and the capacity for long-term adaptation to climate change. And so we use tissue examples, both from capturing bats and taking very small wing tissue samples, as well as from bat carcasses, from wind turbine strikes and other fatalities across the state. Shown here is a general sample map for our tissue collection. Um, I wanna note that the differences between the islands um, are a result of our sampling ability and opportunities for research and misnetting success and the availability of carcasses. This does not in any way represent actual number of living bats. The numbers in red are approximate numbers for sample collections from 2005 to present. And as I mentioned earlier, when I talked about our threats, there is a current lack of knowledge in this realm and therefore getting population genetic information on Opeapea will be invaluable for managing recovery of this species and protecting it from current and future threats. And genetic samples from Kauai that Krista mentioned in the introduction are contributing to this effort. In 2019, we attempted to capture bats at multiple sites across the island. We were successful at the Hanalei National Wildlife Reg Refuge and the Pu'u Kapele Forest Reserve. And these samples represent the first time bats have been captured on the island of Kauai and are incredibly valuable data points for conservation genetics. And now I'd like to take you outside of the genetics lab and switch gears from genetic work to habitat and boost ecology. And first I'd like you to take a few seconds to try and spot the bat in this lychee tree. Um, and while I talk, uh, our overall goals for this roost ecology were to identify roosts, collect tree and greater habitat stand metrics, and evaluate roost fidelity and behavior. Now, if you spotted the bat, then you are among the few that can. If you didn't, no worries. That just illustrates how incredibly cryptic the species can be, especially while at roost. So how do we find bat roosts? First, we must capture band and radio tagged bats. And this has been a year round effort with capture locations at various habitats. Ground tracking begins immediately after capture and tagging. Our battery life on our small beeper tags are lasts about 21 days, but a vast majority of bats remove their tag before the battery dies. And the ultimate goal is visual confirmation of a bat in a tree. And we use a variety of tools, including a thermal imager, binocular spotting scopes to help us spot bats in trees. And when that happens, we collect a variety of roost and habitat metrics, including tree height, diameter of breast height, percent canopy cover, um, dominant and co-dominant species, among other metrics. 
So far, bats have been tracked to 15 different roost tree species, and that includes three species that are native or indigenous to Hawaii, and that is Lama, Ohia, and Luhe. Um, Luhe is notably not a tree. Uh, there are two species that were used the most often, and that is paper bark with 13 different roost trees, and Ohia with 11 different roost trees. And I hope these photos help illustrate how diverse these roosts can be. From 2018 to 2021, maternity roosts have been identified in four different tree species, and that is lychee, paperbark, African tulip, and mango. No maternity roosts were found in the 2018 reproductive season. Three maternity roosts were found in monitoring during the 2019 reproductive season. Five maternity roosts were found and monitored during the 2020 reproductive season and three maternity roosts were found in monitoring during the 2021 reproductive season. Finding maternity roosts is really difficult. So when we do find them, we wanna get all the information that we can. When we have an active or suspected maternity roost, we do rechecks during the daytime, several times a week. And then that helps us determine the timing of birth if we're monitoring a pregnant female, number of pups, possible predation events um, or loss events, and timing of volency and fledging. We also set up thermal cameras to capture nighttime roosting behavior. We know that pups are vulnerable when they are left at the roost, especially non-volant pups. So we want to see if there's predation or disturbance at the roost. We want to see the nighttime interactions between mothers and pups. How many times are they coming back from foraging to check on their pups? Things like that. And these are only questions that we can get at through observation. And in this picture in the blue, there were pups left at a roost while a large barn owl flies by the area. And so this nighttime thermal monitoring, uh, these situations really call for all the stars to align. We have to find and identify a maternity roost. Uh, this roost has to have a clear line of sight from the ground to the perch area. And it has to be safe and accessible for us to leave our equipment overnight. Nighttime thermal monitoring was conducted from 2019 to September 2021. In 2019, we monitored two maternity roosts. In 2020, we monitored five. And in 2021, we monitored two maternity roosts and one non-maternity roost. And the non-maternity was a female that we caught while she was lactating. We tracked her to the roost tree, but we never did see pups with her. And behaviors were documented in a, in a couple of ways. Uh, timing of roost departure and arrival, duration of bouts away from the roost, timing of pup volancy and fledging, rat or predator presence, and we also noted any unique behaviors observed. And so, so now we'll watch some of these thermal videos or at least clips of them. And so in this video, this is a mother returning to her non-volant pups that were left at the roost and the pups are in the blue circle. Next, this is uh, the departure of a mother and a pup. This mother has departed the roost, but comes back around to coax her pup in the blue circle to follow. And she's going to do several swoops up to that roost perch area, and finally the pup will emerge and follow. Next, this is some chasing behavior. And this is likely a mother and her two pups. This could be a teaching moment for foraging and flight. There seems to be um, some of the, the, the bats in this are not as agile and that's probably a pup that's just not quite as good of a flyer as its mother. But one of the challenges is that we obviously can't identify individuals. So there are some limits to inferences we can make when we look at these videos. One of the most important metrics we've uh, considered is predation by rats, cats, and owls. In this case, 
There is a bat roost in the foreground in the blue circle, but you will see a large rat enter the field of view. And while this isn't evidence of predation, it is evidence that rats are active and sharing habitat with our roosting bats. Again, this is a really fast video. So um, this is also rat activity in a roost tree. And in this video, there were two pups that were left at the roost and those are in the small circle in the middle of your screen. And then a mother is returning to them. And as she returns, you're gonna see a rat scurry away on the lower right side of the video. And I can play this twice since it happens pretty quickly. That's the mother returning, and then the rat will scurry away. And we can watch that again real quick. Again, not evidence of predation, but rats are definitely active in these roost trees, in some of them. And so this is a really interesting video. This is an example of disturbance at a roost or actually a lack thereof. And so this is a, an observation that we recently had. Um, in this video, there is a single bat that is in that blue circle and it is roosting there. And this is close to sunrise when we typically stop our thermal recordings. And these are birds that have become more active. And then can you see flying from branch to branch, very close to the area where a bat was roosting. And while we might not think the birds were the best neighbors in this case, it didn't seem to disturb the roosting bat too much. And finally, this is a, rich, a bat returning to roost at dawn. Um, this bat's gonna be entering from the left side of the view. And this also exhibits some swooping behavior before finally returning to its pup after a night of foraging. And so our results so far for this data, um, a total of 542 hours of thermal video was collected during the 2019 reproductive season. So far, this has been analyzed for departure and arrival as well as scanned for poten potential predator behavior. Departure from roosts ranged from 53 minutes before sunset to 20 minutes after sunset and arrival back at roosts range from 41 minutes to 11 minutes before sunrise. Behavior documented included quantitative metrics like number of flight bouts per night, timing of pup flight relative to its mother, as well as qualitative metrics like noting swooping at the perch and chase behavior and rat or other potential predator presence. We collected 1,395 hours of thermal video for the 2020 reproductive season and over 2,000 hours for the 2021 reproductive season. And currently we are in the middle of completing video review for the 2020 and 2021 reproductive seasons. And like our conservation genetics and our Hawaii Island bat diet work, you're gonna have to stay tuned for the results for our roost ecology. There's still a lot of work to do to review, document and analyze all these data but we're working really hard to complete our final data analysis and write-up so that we can get this critical information out there. And this long-term project has been a ton of work by our USGS and HCSU BAT project team. We couldn't have done it without our funders and general generous access to federal, state, and private lands. And of course, we have to thank the BATs. Um, preliminary roost data from 2018 and 2019 can be found at USGS Science Base, as well as previous studies that I mentioned, including the genetic sex determination and the bat diet DNA metabarcoding from Maui. And thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. And thanks again for bearing with me through uh, all technical difficulties at the beginning. Thank you so much, Christina. So we do have several questions in the queue and also one that came in through the chat. Um, so if anyone has questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. So our first question came through actually on the chat and it is, 
Please say more about the impact of wind energy on bats. So, oh, I'm sorry. So sorry. I didn't realize I had, did I unmute myself or was I speaking to myself? No, I, I, I think it's, it's really quiet on my end. So I'm going to turn it off. The impact of wind energy on bats um, in general, um, across the world, the United States, Hawaii, there has been a negative impact of wind energy on, on bats. Um, in the mainland, particularly migrating bats are hit pretty hard by wind energy. Um, in Hawaii, there has been wind, uh, fatalities at wind turbines. I think folks are working really hard to mitigate that and we are, you know, part of that research. Um, I hope that answers some of your questions. All right, next question. Uh, what are possible predators? So in our study, in, in our thermal videos and everything so far, we haven't caught on, on video a predation event yet but it is definitely possible that rats or owls um, could be potential predators, even maybe cats in, in some ways. Um, the most vulnerable time really for bats um, are those non-volant pups, right? They're not flying yet and they're left at a roost perch when their mother leaves for the night. And so that's probably the greatest threat um, so yeah, while we haven't seen evidence of predation, it's it's definitely possible and, and I'm sure that it happens in some cases. All right, next question. Do the bats return to the same location to pup each year? Great question. So we go back um, when we, find a maternity roost, um, we go back and monitor that a year round we've been trying to, but particularly in the reproductive season. And there has been a few cases of a female coming back to a roost tree that was used year before. We've also had bats that are unknown because we banned our bats with um, unique color coded bands. That way we know who an individual is. Um, and we've had several cases where we've gone back to a maternity roost tree and there's been an unbanded unknown bat that has also had their pups there. And so whether this is a, a young that was born there in previous years, um, it's also possible that bats can remove their bands um, but yeah, there are definitely cases where a maternity roost tree is used by bats again in subsequent years. Not all of them, but some of them are. And figuring out why that is, what if there's something special about that roost tree is, is one of the things we're trying to get at. Right, thank you. All right, our next one is about white nose syndrome. And this is, um, are Opeopea subject to white nose syndrome? Is that disease here in Hawaii? So we did a study uh, up um, in the caves on Mauna Loa and we swabbed um, in the lava tubes. And so we swabbed cave substrate and looked at uh, if there was any potential for that fungus to grow there. Um, the one thing that our species has in its favor is that our bats don't do, in general, overwintering hibernation, which is the real risk from white nose syndrome. In mainland species, uh, white, nose, white nose syndrome uh, rouses them from their hibernation in the winter, and that's very dangerous because if they wake up from that hibernation, there's not food resources and it's too cold for them and, and many bats die. And so since our, um, and, and that's particularly, it spreads particularly uh, quickly in large colonial species as well. And so for our bats, we have a few advantages where we are probably not at as high a risk for white nose syndrome. And that is, we don't have these 
large colonies, right? We have a solitary species and we don't have these long overwintering hibernation periods where there's just absolutely no food resources where, uh, you know, a Hawaiian hoary bat couldn't find food. Um, but we did look at, you know, these lava tubes and we didn't find first any evidence that, you know, our species are um, roosting in lava tubes. And so that's good um, in some ways. And we didn't find any evidence of the pseudo gymnoascus destructions uh, fungus in these in these lava tubes. And with one caveat, I would say if you are a caver or someone who enjoys going into these caves, um, I would still be very careful about your protocol and the gear that you bring into these lava tubes. Um, because that's not something that's not a road that we want to go down. And so if you're in caves in the mainland and you visit caves in Hawaii, it's always recommended to bring, you know, all new gear just to even avoid that situation of introducing something that we really don't want here. All righty. Um, next question is, where I lived on the mainland, we would erect bat houses on our properties where little brown bats could roost. Is that possible here? And this question is coming from the leeward side of Hawaii Island. So yeah, we get this question a lot. And unfortunately, our, you know, our bats are, are tree roosting. They don't roost in crevices and um, in building structures. So bat houses are not going to be particularly helpful to them. Um, I, I wish it was, and that would be a really nice, easy way to benefit our bat species. But um, yeah, bat houses are, are, are not going to help our Hawaiian hoary bat, which prefers, yeah, the foliage of trees. Thanks for that, Christina. Uh, the next question is, do you know what type of thermal detector was used in your photo and video data collection? So yeah, the, the imager that we use to help us find bats um, in roost trees, we have a couple. We have a, a FLIR, um, and then we also have a fluke that we've used that has been particularly helpful in some cases in helping us find bats in trees. And then our cameras are, are a, different, a little bit of a different system. Um, they are access Axis brand, I can't remember uh, the exact model, but those allow us to leave um, them out there overnight or for several nights and image the bat in the trees. So we have a couple of different technologies that we use there. All right, the next question is, are there plans to breed bats in captivity? Um, no. <laughs> No, there's not. Uh, even rehabbing our opeapea is really difficult. And so captive breeding has not been um, a method of conservation or preservation of this species that I have even heard as being on the table. I, we, have, we have lots and lots of questions for you, Christina, and it's possible we won't get to all of them in the allotted time. Would you be willing to have us email all the questions to you and we can give responses back or provide your email address to those who are on the, the lecture today? Sure, yeah, you can. I'm happy to answer um, questions via email. Okay, so we'll put your uh, email address in the chat just in case we don't get to everybody, okay? Uh, the next question, though, is at what age can our bats start reproducing? That is a great question. Um, and I don't actually have the answer to that. I would suspect within the next year, um, it, that's what's seen in mainland species, but uh, that hasn't been investigated in our bat yet. All right, we also have two questions actually about water. Um, so the first one is, how important are water features in bat habitat? Do they drink from constructed ponds or water tanks? And as a follow-up, um, they roost in trees. Do they prefer a water source? Um, this attendee saw one fly by their house once in 30 years, and it was amazing. And they're wondering if, if it might have been roosting and what their range is. 
So as far as um, water features, that's a really cool question. And it's one that we started observing when we did work um, in Maui, uh, you know, the bat diet study that I, I mentioned. Um, our researchers out there did notice that in those um, upcountry areas that bats were sort of visiting these uh, open tanks that were used for livestock, um, what, giving water to livestock. And so it's something that we've, we've sort of honed in on a little bit more and started looking at more closely. And yeah, in some cases, bats do seek out those water features, uh, possibly to drink, possibly to eat insects um, off the surface of that water or near, near the water. And so um, water sources in some ways have become good places for us to go and investigate catching bats. And I'm sorry, what was the second question? Oh, I think you, I think you nailed most of it, yeah. Um, next question is, what can residents do to be good neighbors with um, the Obeapea? Uh, yeah, how can we help them? Well, you know, just sort of becoming aware, and and I, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but I, I love people who are interested in bats and learning more about them. And I think, you know, it's important to sort of break some of the stigmas about them. And also, you know, maybe protect your large trees. It's not unheard of that an opiapea is roosting in someone's yard. And so keep your eye to the sky and, you know, and, and your trees and, and hopefully you would be blessed by seeing an opiapea in your tree. I mean, next question is, how long does it take to get the genotyping results back on the sex determination? Hours, weeks, or days? Oh boy, um, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, but it's definitely not hours. So um, more like weeks or months on that one. It's, a, it's quite an involved study. So yeah, lots of steps and lots of collaborators and lots of moving parts for that. It would be amazing if it was ours though. We're just gonna keep them coming at you, Christina. This one is sure. with temperature sensitive radio telemetry available, have you been able to document daily torpor? So we did actually test some temperature sensitive tags um, and we didn't have great results and we don't actually quite know why. Um, we have had a few anecdotes of torpor. So we know that it's something that bats, um, our bats can use. Uh, we haven't seen it a lot, but um, yeah, there, there are times when, when bats, when our bats go into torpor, one of them just off the top of my head, I think we had a couple of nights, um, days of really rainy weather. And we had already identified this bat in a tree and we had our thermal imager with, with us and we could spot it, you know, with our binos, we were looking at it. And then on the thermal imager, it just wasn't coming up at all. And when we looked at it, you know, it had, um, like some rain droplets around it. And it was, it was probably a situation where, the weather was just really poor and the bat, uh, you know, wanted to make torpor for a period of time because foraging probably wasn't very good at the time. But um, yeah, we, we have, we have seen, we have seen it. We have some anecdotes, um, but yeah, our, our, unfortunately our temperature sensitive tags, uh, they were not successful. It would be nice to try and revisit that though. All right, the next question is, are there metrics you could use to identify potential roost habitats within a stand, such as species type or density, or have they been observed to roost in all habitat types? So that's that's what I'm working on right now is really teasing apart um, if there's differences in 
these trees, if there's differences in these habitat stands that they're in, if there's not differences, if they're just super generalist and can kind of roost anywhere. So um, yeah, that is where I'm at right now at this moment is trying to tease apart all these data, um, these roost data and, and see where we're at with it. Another question is why do bats hit windmills since they have such great echolocation senses? That's like the million dollar question <laughs> that I'm sure everybody would would love to know the answer to. There's um, there's a lot of theories out there. Um, some of them are that windmills are these, you know, emergent structures on the landscape and um, some species of bat use large snags or trees uh, for lacking behavior, for mating behavior, um, to sort of meet up and, and mate. Um, there's other theories that wind turbines attract insects. And so bats are attracted to these areas where there's lots of insects. And so, yeah, there's, there's other theories beyond that too. And so, yeah, super great question. And I wish that I had a really nice clean answer for it, but unfortunately I don't. Another one is, do you seek volunteers to help with your mission? We do. Um, unfortunately, we've finished for our big project from 2018 to 2021, we have finished all of our field work. And so, yeah, we are in this heavy data analysis and write up period. And so, yeah, we're not doing field work at the time, but um, yeah, we, we, we do rely on volunteers and they've contributed a ton to the successes of, you know, our, our research over the years. Are there other bats in Hawaii? No, no, we have just our one species and we love them. If we regularly observe bats near our home, should we report this? And if so, to whom? Um, I would love to know. You can always let me know. Um, we like that sort of citizen science, you know, that, that, um, that helps us, you know, get anecdotes on their distribution. Okay, only two questions left. You're getting close. Um, have you noticed that the young of the year are more reddish in color? Uh, I'm thinking it takes time to develop the hoary coloration and wonder if that is consistent with your observations. And have you seen very hoary colored pups? Um, you know, the, that's a, a good question about the coloration. Um, no, we see, you know, our, in our observations, we see reddish pups, we see hoary pups, um, we see females that are red or hoary, we see males that are red or hoary. There's just um, all this variation and, and there hasn't been any trend on if the hoary develops later, if males are more hoary than females, there doesn't seem to be any trend that in indicates any of that. All right, and our final question of the day is, did the genetic sex determination of the wind turbine strike carcasses indicate a prevalence of one sex over another? And if so, what might cause this? Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Um, part of that study, what we did find was that a lot of the unknown bats were female and that was partially due to their, their degradation. The external genitalia of females was really hard to determine compared to males. And so, um, they often fell into that unknown category. But that would be a great question for Karina Panzari, who um, was the head of that study. And so I can definitely ask her if you want to email me that or email Karina, I can forward that question to her. She probably has 
uh, a more elegant answer that I just gave. All right, that was our final questions. Do we have any, any last minute questions? All right, so thank you everyone so much for coming and joining us for Wildlife Wednesdays. And I'm gonna turn the mic over to Krista now for any closing remarks. Yeah, just thank you to all who attended and thank you especially to Christina and the good work that you're doing with a species that can really get left behind. Um, we have a lot of the coming obstacles with climate change and invasive species and those sorts of things. So thank you. And you're getting lots and lots of praise from the participants that were on the panel today. So thank you very much, Christina. We look forward to your outcome of your research. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Oh, I appreciate it.